Would you take our Bibles and open them to the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, and we're continuing on these parables that Jesus is teaching here. And uh, remember that parables are earthly stories with heavenly meanings. We see, beginning with verse 24, he tells a parable about the wheat and the tares. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. What is all that about? We're going to see. Not only what that is about, but he tells another parable about the mustard seed and tells one about leaven, and then he goes on and explains the one about the wheat and the tares. So we'll see it in just a moment. May the Lord bless the reading of his inerrant and infallible divine holy word. So we look at verse 24. There again it says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, the kingdom of heaven. Now, these parables that he's teaching are about the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about our eternal home, our place where we'll be with God forevermore when we leave this life on this earth. Jesus said in Matthew four seventeen, again, and I quoted this verse this morning. He said, repent Ye, because the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. We're to stop living the ways of the world and do a 180 degree turn and start going the right way for God, living for him, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did he mean by that? Because Jesus is the one who created the kingdom of heaven. It is where he is now. It is where, why he died on the cross so we can be there. And uh, so the kingdom of heaven, Jesus being on the earth at that time, revealed to people that the kingdom of heaven had come to be with them. We, because of his shed blood on the cross, will go to where he is. And these parables are, are earthly stories with heavenly meanings to reveal to us truths in regards to this kingdom. And uh, he told these stories to the people because uh, some could not behold the truth as it really was, and others, they could see the simplicity of the stories that they could relate to and they could understand. And so he's teaching them in these parables in regards to heaven our kingdom home. It says in verse 24, he said, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in, the, in his field. Now, I don't know, but it tells us in verse 1 that Jesus had gone out of a house. And when he went out of a house, perhaps, I mean, this is just pure speculation on my part. No one knows. But perhaps, and it's just a thought, he might have seen a farmer sowing seed, which would have led him naturally, understandably so, to share a parable uh, about a man or a farmer sowing seed on different kinds of ground. Uh, He sowed on the hard ground, which is the beaten path where people would walk on. And and, and in so doing, in telling this story, he is comparing it to our hearts, Our heart is like a soil that uh, God sows seed into our heart. When I'm preaching God's word, this is God's seed being uh, sowed into our hearts. And our hearts might be stubborn. They might be hard. They might be like the beaten path, whereas everything I say may bounce off our heart and will be snatched away by the devil. And then uh, he told the story about how uh, seed was sown in rocky ground. 
which is a topsoil that had some rocks in it, and, uh, and the seeds would be sown, and, and, and all of a sudden there would be, it shoot up, the plant would, but it did not take deep root and would quickly be scorched in the sun. Many of us may hear God's word, and we'll get excited about it, particularly, in, for example, in a situation like a revival. We'll get so moved to where we'll go to the altar and make decisions for Christ. But then we go out the door and there's not any significant change. And what we have heard, it took off really fast the excitement that's in us, but it didn't take deep root. And then when persecution and things of life happen, then all of a sudden we get burned out and we quit. It happens so often. He told about a third kind of heart soil and said the seed is sown among thorns. Now we all know this. I'm not a planter. I'm not a farmer. Far from it. But I have enough common sense to know that if you're going to sow seed, don't sow it among thorns. The, sorn, the thorns will take all the nutrients and, and they'll choke away that that is sown to where it cannot live or survive. And so many of us, we have the thorns represent distractions and thoughts that are in our life. And we're, we may be sitting here right now hearing God's word being preached from the pulpit by the pastor. But we've got our minds on other things. We're not absorbing what is being proclaimed because we're worried about this or we're worried about that. And we're thinking about this or thinking about that and those thorns will took away anything we hear until it just perishes away. Then he mentioned a fourth kind of heart soil, and that is the good soil, where I can stand here and I can preach God's inerrant and infallible divine holy word, and we can receive it, and it goes right into our heart, and it begins to grow in us, and we begin to bear fruit. That's what God wants and expects of us. So perhaps as he sees that same farmer, just a thought, I don't know, but perhaps as he sees that same farmer, he goes on and tells another parable about someone sowing seeds. And it is one who is sowing the seeds for wheat in a wheat field. And, and let's look at it. So you see in verse 24, it says, The kingdom of heaven is likened to a man or a farmer which sowed good seed in his field. And, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares. What a bad thing, right? That'd be, that'd be horrible for a farmer to sow good seed in his field to grow wheat. And then he has an enemy, and that enemy comes and sows bad seed. Bad seed among his good seed. That'd be terrible, right? Well, it would be. And, and, and I'm going to get back into that a little bit deeper in just a moment. But what kind of bad seed would this be? And who would be the enemy? Well, it could be that the farmer just has someone that doesn't like him. Maybe someone that's jealous of him. And so has a, a, a very ill plan. Has a very, uh, it's a mean thing for him to do. But he decides he's going to sow bad seed among that farmer's good seed. And the bad seed is called tares, the plant that would grow up. It'd be some kind of like a weed. But let me tell you what this tare was. It was something called the bearded darnel. This was something that looked very much like wheat when it was sowed or sown by a farmer. It looked very much like wheat. In fact, wheat and the bearded bar darnel, they were indistinguishable until the, the ear would come forth on the plant, till the ear would form. And then on the true wheat, you'd see the seeds or the fruit being born. Whereas on the darnel, which is the weed, you would not, you'd see the, the difference. But as they're growing up together, they're indistinguishable. The wheat and the tares, they look alike. They look alike. In fact, it is said that uh, the fragrance of them, the color, and everything would resemble each other. 
So then it says in verse 26, but when the blade was sprung up by the harvesters or by the reapers and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. When it's time, harvest time and time to gather up the wheat, they'd see that there's weeds growing up among it. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? Didn't you sow good seed, wheat in your field? From whence hath it tares, or why does it have tares? This darnel that's growing in it, why? And the farmer says to his workers, the people that would go and gather the wheat, an enemy had done this. The servant said to him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, No, don't do that. The farmer said, If you go out there and you try to grab the wheat and pull it out among the weeds, you're bound to grab a whole lot of weeds with it. And if you go out there in the field and try to grab all the weeds and throw them out, you're bound to grab a whole lot of good wheat and destroy it likewise. So leave it alone. Leave it alone, says the farmer, and let the wheat and the weeds grow together. The wheat and the tares. Just let them grow together. He said, lest, verse 29, while you gather up the tares, you root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together, he said, until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares, all the weeds, gather them together, and you can see, wait till harvest time, because that's when you can distinguish the difference because the bearded darnel will look different than the wheat. It will not have the seeds on the end of it, on the ear. It will not look the same as the wheat. Then you can distinguish them. You can understand the differences between them. So let them both grow together right now until the harvest. In the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather you together first the tares and bind them in bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. That's what Jesus said in this story. Now they're all sitting there thinking, what does that mean? Then he goes on and he tells them another story. This one is about the mustard seed. The mustard seed is a seed that's probably about this big around. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm teasing you. It's not big. It's tiny. The mustard seed was very, very small, very small. In fact, it's among the smallest of seeds. So he says it in this story. Look at it in verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. Now, the word filled there in this particular story is a word which represents the world. And the man which sowed the seed, the mustard seed, represents Jesus. So Jesus, as he's telling the story about the mustard seed, he says that I have sown a seed in the world. And the mustard seed typifies and is a picture of the church. See, when Jesus walked up that hill carrying the cross on his back, and he laid down willingly upon that tree. They lifted it up, and he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. That was Jesus sowing the church into the world. He's the farmer who sowed the seed. The church is the mustard seed, and the field is the world. So the church was small in its beginnings. It started out with a ragtag bunch of 12 men, mostly fishermen turned disciples, who were uneducated. They were poor, mostly. And they began to follow him. They're his first followers. Do you know how many people were at the ascension when Jesus ascended to go to the Father after his resurrection and being on this earth 
40 days following the resurrection. You know where? I mean, how many people were there? The book of Acts tells us there were 120 people there. So, you know, Judas had already betrayed Christ, and he took his own life. And so there was 11 disciples there, and there were 120 total by this time. And then you see that on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down and baptized those followers at the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people got saved. Wow, what a significant growth in that church. Then you go on and look at Acts chapter 4, verse 4, and there it says it grew from 3,000 to 5,000. There are literally millions of Christians in the world today. Millions. Started out like a little mustard seed. But let's go on and look at the story. He says here in verse 31, or verse 32, which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs. The word herbs is a word which means any green plant or a bush. Not necessarily a tree, but like a green plant or a bush. But this seed became a tree. It becometh a tree, not in nature, but in size. So in other words, grew to become a big bush. And so he's telling the story. Don't picture a tree like we know of a tree. Think of a great big shrub, a big bush, big bush. This is tall or big as a tree. And that's an unusual growth for the mustard seed. But it grew at a rapid pace, and it grew big. And in the story, Jesus says of the mustard tree, he said that birds of the air came and lodged in the branches thereof. Now, do you know, I like birds. I like to see them up in the trees. I like to hear them chirping and all that kind of stuff. But in, in biblically, except for the dove, biblically, birds usually typify Satan, the devil. And so when you see that it tells us in this story, in this parable, he, he says that birds came and lodged in the branches of the mustard tree, that is, birds came and lodged in the branches of the church, that means that through the years, the decades and centuries and of the existence of the church ever since Christ died on the cross until this day, there have been people infiltrating into the church all kinds of false doctrines, all kinds of evil, all kinds of bad things. And so there's good and bad in the church even. Believe it or not, there really is. There's a lot of good and there's a lot of bad. He elaborates a little further by telling another story and he really leaves it up to our imagination and thoughts to figure the mustard parable out. But we can kind of see it in its simplistic uh, deliverance unto us by him. We can kind of understand it and what he's telling us. Then he talks about something called leaven. Leaven is a dough. It's something that's put into bread. It says in verse 33, Behold, uh, another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is likened to leaven. Leaven. Oh, that's a bad thing. Leaven made bread rise, right? But leaven in the Bible typified sin, typified evil and wickedness. For example, when God told the Israelites, told Moses to lead them out of their bondage of slavery in Egypt, he told them that they were to eat unleavened bread that night at the Passover meal. And for years, the Israelites, they would observe every year in the Passover, in the month of Nisan, which corresponded with our month of March or April. And that, that would be, the Passover would, would be one event where they would eat this meal. And then following that would be a feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would last for seven days where for seven days the Israelites were to remove all leaven from their house. All leaven. They were to have unleavened bread. They, could not, they had to have this flat bread. They could not have the bread to rise. So Exodus twelve fifteen says, Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put it a, a leaven away out of your houses. 
For whoso eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut out of, from Israel. It was so serious that God said, leaven typified sin, so he's saying, get rid of the leaven, but what he was more so saying is get rid of the sin that's in your lives. Repent of your sins. Get your heart right. Because if you don't, you're going to be cut out or from the people of Israel. And Jesus even mentioned, he may mention us something similar to that when he saw the Pharisees one day. And we see this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 6, when he said of the Pharisees, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. That is their sin. Paul made reference to it. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6 and 7, he said, Know you not that, you're, that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? If there's a little sin in us, it's like a bowl of bad apples. You may have, or a bowl of good apples, rather. If you have one bad apple, eventually it's going to spread to the others, make them all go bad. So a little bit of sin in our life can just really corrupt us inwardly to the point that where we become rotten like an apple, so to speak. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, it says, or a new person, as you are unleavened, for Christ, our, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So, look at this parable then. He tells us in verse 33, a woman took and hid three measures of meal, and the whole was leavened. He's telling a story about a woman who's cooking. She's baking. Most of you women like to bake, I'm sure. And this woman was baking, but she was quite impressive of a baker. I'll tell you why. Because she hid some leaven in three measures of a mill. And as I did my studying on that, I understand that three measures of a mill equals up to 40 liters, which they say can produce enough bread to feed 100 men. And she did some serious baking there, did she? But she hid, the thing about it is, though, she hid leaven in the bread that no one knew about. And it all of a sudden began to corrupt the bread as it's being cooked and eventually spread to all of the bread and just ruined it. We may think we can hide sin in our lives to where people won't see it and won't know it. But God knows it's there. And unless we get rid of it, it can inwardly corrupt us to where we become, like I said, like a rotten apple, so to speak. So Jesus is telling us for a reason, to get rid of the leaven that's in our lives. Then he, it says in verse 34 and 35, These things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable, speaking not unto them. It doesn't mean that every, all of his teaching was parables, no. Because we see, like the Sermon on the Mount, that's not parables. It just means that that particular time he was speaking in parables. In verse 35, he said that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. What prophet? A prophet by the name of Asaph, who was a musician who worked with and for David. Asaph, this musician, who was also a prophet, said in the 78th Psalm, verse 2, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. That was a prophecy of Jesus teaching in parables. So as we see then, verse 35, he said, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. We know things today that Abraham didn't know. Can you believe that? That's phenomenal when you think about it. We know things today in the church that Moses didn't know about, that David didn't know about, that Isaiah didn't know about. Elijah didn't know these things. But they've been revealed to us through the apostles and the church. And then it says in verse 36, Jesus sent the multitude away. I don't know how many people was there. There had to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. A lot of people there to hear him preach. So he sends them away. By the way, where was he at? I said it last week that when he went out of the house, he went and got in a fishing boat. He's in the Sea of Galilee. The people out on the beach, they're on the seashore. And the acoustics of the mountains surrounding the Sea of Galilee, which is way down below sea level, his voice was able to travel and the people could hear him. 
I don't know, maybe it's getting late in the day. It doesn't really tell us. We can only speculate and wonder again. We can only read between the lines and wonder. But perhaps it's getting late in the day and he sends the multitudes away. Not because he didn't want to preach to them or teach them or minister to them and help them and love them. Maybe it was convenient at the moment that he sent them away. And so he and the disciples go back into the house. What house were they in? I don't know. It was a house. And whose house it was, don't know, but the, hospi- the, the hospitality in those days, traveling preachers and teachers would be uh, housed by friendly people who would welcome them into their homes. So they go into a house, and it says here that the disciples approached him. They Notice they didn't ask about the mustard seed parable, and they did not ask about the, the parable of the leaven, but they did say, hey, Jesus, getting back to that story you were telling us a little bit ago, remember about the farmer sowing the wheat and the tares. Can you explain that to us? They said in verse 36, declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So he answered them. He gives an explanation. He said, he that sowed the good seed is the son of man. Just like I said, Jesus sowed uh, the the mustard seed, which is the church, and the field, which is the world. Jesus is the son of man here who sows this seed, the wheat, and the wheat field. He says in verse 38, the field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. Who are the children of the kingdom? The Israelites? No, you and I, the church. Is anyone who would believe in his son as Savior? We're the children of the kingdom. And so he sowed us into this world as the church. We're the wheat in the wheat field. He says uh, in verse 38, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. That's common sense. We know who the wicked one is. The devil, Satan. So the tares are the children of the devil and the wheat are the children of the son of man, which is Christ. And the devil is sowing lost people throughout the world too. Now, there might be lost people among us in the church. There's a great real possibility of that. For Jesus said in Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. And it might be that there are people that are among us that look like us and talk like us, act like us, but are not with and of us. Because they may be children of the wicked one. They may be tares in the same field. Well, Jesus says here, In verse 39, the enemy that sowed the the bad seed or the tares is the devil himself. Verse 39, the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. As I preached so hard this morning, so hard, I said that the end of the world is going to come. And every day we live, we're a day closer. It's going to come. That's harvest day. That's when the reapers, which are God's angels, are going to come. And they're going to uh, gather the wheat and put them in his barn and gather the tares and burn them. It says in verse 40, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said that in Matthew 25, 41. He made reference to Christians and lost people being like sheep and goats there. And he said the goats will be like on the left hand. And he'll say to them, Depart from me, you cursed in the everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. And the sheep will be on the right hand, which are the Christians. And he'll look at them and he'll say, Enter in, come, you blessed of my Father. Enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Amen. Then, verse 43 says, 
Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He said, who hath ears? Let him hear. He said, listen to what I'm saying. Listen. Verse 30. Again, the wheat and the tares. He said, let both grow together until the harvest. You see, that's very important as I close. I'm closing with this. Wheat and tares. We can play judge, can't we? We could do that. I could look at people in the world and I can say, that man, that woman, he, she, they're lost. They're bound for hell. I could say that. I could play judge. But you know what? I really don't know. So in reality, no, I can't play judge. Yes, I can, but I shouldn't. And in fact, Matthew 7, 1, Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged yourself. So we can't play judge. Only Jesus is the judge. You read it. You look it up. John 5, 22 tells us he's the judge. He'll make that determination. He will decide who's lost, who's saved, who's wheat and who's tares. So... Uh, we could play judge and we could go out there and start uprooting everybody in the world and say, Jesus, I'm going to help you. And we're going to be an onward Christian army. We're going to be a, a workers in the fields. Uh, the, 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 we're going to go out there and we're going to take all the lost people. We're going to gather them together so that they can go to hell forevermore. We can't do that. We can't do it. So Jesus says, let us both grow together. Till the harvest, then it will be made known. Because see, like when the wheat and the darnel grows together, when the ear comes forth, you can see which one is bearing fruit and which one is not. When the, on harvest day, it'll be so clear who's bearing the fruit of Christianity and who is a weed, a tear that's not bearing fruit and is lost. And will be burned forevermore. Does everybody understand this? It's so simple to understand. And I do thank you for listening to this message. Would you pray with me? Our dear Heavenly.